Bible or something with your Bible on it, lift it up, repeat after me. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I will do what it says I can do. Today I'll be taught the Word of God. I boldly confess. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I am about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever living seed of the Word of God. I'll never be the same. Never, never, never. Never be the same. In Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to start in Hebrews. And we're actually going to back up a little bit. We're going to go to Hebrews chapter 10 because that, the end of that chapter kind of catapults us into chapter 11. What the handout is, is it's a thing called cross-references, and a lot of Bibles have them. It's available online. And what it is, is as we've been going through the book of Hebrews, I've been trying to call out every time they reference something out of the Old Testament. So you've heard Psalms 110 verse 1 a lot. You've heard a few verses quite a few times. However... I didn't count, but it seems that about half of the Old Testament references in the book of Hebrews are in the 40 verses of chapter 11. So instead of having to tilt my Bible so I can read them all because I wrote them on the pages, I, get, I made a printout. So as you follow along, or if you look at this when you're at home, you can see where all of these things are being pulled from. But where we're going to start, we're going to go back to verse 35 of chapter 10. And we remember what happened in chapter 10 is we get what I think of as the thesis statement of the book of Hebrews in verses 19 through 22, where it says, since Jesus Christ has opened up this new and living way for us into a relationship with God by having sprinkled his blood on the mercy seat in heaven and sprinkled our hearts clean and washed us with the water of Holy Spirit. Let us boldly approach the throne of grace in unqualified assurance of faith. Faith is how we live our Christian walk. Now these were Hebrews, like I've said time and again, this was written to Hebrew people. People who were used to following rules and following laws and they had all these barriers that were set up between them and God in their relationship with him under the Old Covenant. But some time has passed, and the writer of Hebrews is encouraging them, you're not under the Old Covenant anymore. You don't need to go back to the Old Covenant. It's old. We got a new one. As I've said a few times, it's like telling someone who has a new, brand new PC, I've got a computer for you. What does it run? One runs Windows 95. I don't think people are willing to jump back to Windows 95 if you got something with Windows 10 on it, or 11. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. So he starts in 35. He says, Do not therefore fling away your fearless confidence, for it has a gr glorious and great reward. For you have need of patient endurance to bear up under difficult circumstances without compromising, so that when you have carried out the will of God, you may receive and enjoy to the full what is promised. Yet, for yet in a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one, the one justified by faith, shall live by faith, respecting man's relationship to God and trusting him. And if he draws back, shrinking in fear, my soul has no delight in him. That's Habakkuk 2, verses 3 through 4. It's not on the handout. But it says in 38, the righteous one shall live by faith. But our way is not that of those who shrink back to destruction, but we are of those who believe, relying on God through faith in Jesus Christ, the Messiah, and by this confident faith, preserve the soul. And so that's what barrels you into Hebrews 11.1, 1, one of the most famous verses, I think, in the New Testament. Now, faith is the assurance, the title deed, the confirmation of things hoped for divinely and things divinely guaranteed, and the evidence of things not seen, the conviction of their reality. Faith comprehends as a fact what cannot be experienced by the physical senses. That is what I like to call the noun definition of faith. That is what faith is as an object. 
When someone says, what is faith? That's what it is. However, I'm going to supplement. If we can run to Colossians chapter 1, verse 4, there's a second explanation I have found for faith that I happen to like, and because they've let me have the microphone, that's where we're going to go for just a moment. I call this one, once I get to it in my Bible, the verb definition of faith, and of course she has it up on the screen before I can flip to it. That's how well they run things back there, and you can tell there's a human up here. For we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, how you lean on him with absolute trust in his power, absolute confidence, I'm sorry, in his power, wisdom, and goodness. That bracketed station, that bracketed statement, that is what faith looks like. That's what it walks like. That's what it talks like. You lean on Christ with absolute confidence in his power, wisdom, and goodness. Not yours, not your friends, not your pastors, Christ's. So jumping back to Hebrews chapter 11. For this faith isn't something tangible, but its results are. For by this kind of faith, verse 2, the men of old gained divine approval. Well, who are the men of old? Folks in the Old Testament. The patriarchs. The prophets, the kings, the judges, all of the people in the Old Testament were considered men of old, and the women would have been women of old. But it's by that kind of faith, the faith that takes a promise of God and goes, yes, this is true. Not it might be, not I hope it will be. But God has divinely guaranteed this thing to me, and I will, I will lose my hand before I let go of holding on to this. That's the nice churchy way for me to say it, because I'm being recorded and this is going live on the internet. <laughs> in verse 3, by faith, that is, with an inherent trust and enduring confidence in the power, wisdom, and goodness of God, we understand that the worlds, the universes, the ages were framed and created, formed, put in order, and equipped for their intended purpose by the word of God. So that, which was, so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. You and I weren't there at the start of creation. Only the Father was. Only the Son was. Only Holy Spirit was there. It was only the Godhead that was present. But this word tells us exactly how it happened. We have faith that this word of God is trustworthy. And so we can say definitively, this is how creation happened. God said, let there be light, and there was light. And he separated the day and the night. He separated the waters from the land. He made the birds of the air and the beasts of the land. He made the creatures that go under the sea and the things that crawl under the ground. He made man in his own image. And he breathed life into him. And when he saw that man needed a companion, he put him to sleep, took out a rib, fashioned woman, woke him up and said, here you go. There's a reason, by the way, guys. It, it means a whole lot when Adam says, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. He was not being figurative. Anyway, moving on. This word tells us, and this word is trustworthy, to let us know things like how creation happened. That God spoke, and the word of God, which is Christ, accomplished what the Father said. Verse 4. Oh, and by the way, he's refuting at the end of verse 3. There was, a sign, there was an argument among scientists of the time that the universe was actually formed from things that already existed. That there was some sort of primordial soup, if you will, floating around, and God just fit it into a nice, neat order. But that's not what the Bible tells us. The Latin term for what the Bible tells us is ex nihilo, means from nothing, because God made everything, from nothing, because he's the only one who can do that. By faith, verse 4, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which it was testified of him that he was righteous, he was upright, he was in right standing with God. And God testified by accepting his gifts. And though he died, yet through this act of faith, he still speaks. Was the difference in the quality of the offering, is that why 
God rejected Cain's gift? Not according to this. According to this, it was the fact that Abel gave his gift in faith, and Cain must not have. In verse 5, it says, By faith that pleased God, Enoch was caught up and taken to heaven so that he would not have a glimpse of death, and he was not found because God had taken him. For even before he was taken to heaven, he received a testimony still on record that he walked with God and pleased him. Enoch is present in the book of Genesis for all of three or four verses. You're told he was born, this is how long he lived, and God took him. That's it. (laughs) I don't think we have a record of any kids that Enoch had. If we do, it was briefly mentioned. That's the only time he's mentioned it. By the way, I think it's very interesting. Enoch is one of the two people in the Bible who never died. Enoch and Elijah. Now, I would be perfectly fine with leaving this earth the way Elijah did. If God just sent down a chariot of fire, I hop on, and then I leave. That's a great way. I'd be okay with that. It's that and the rapture. Those are my two acceptable exits. Everything else is not worth it. But Enoch, for all that short time he was mentioned, the writer says he must have had faith that pleased God. That's why God took him. He was in that type of relationship with God. He was... He walked with an inherent trust and enduring confidence in the power, wisdom, and goodness of God, like it says in the brackets back in verse 3. And it pleased God. Well, why did it please God? Because in verse 6, without faith, it is impossible to walk with God and please him. Now, it didn't say it's really tough, but you could do it. It didn't say if you give enough money. It didn't say if you donate enough time. It didn't say if you feel bad enough about yourself. It said without faith, without a firm, inherent trust in God and confidence in his wisdom, power, and goodness, and having Jesus in your heart, I'm going to add, because that's the only way that your faith is realized and that you get that intimate relationship with God. He didn't say that because this is written to believers. It is only by faith that you can walk with God and please him. Because if you want to have a relationship with God, if you want to draw near to God and have him feel close to you, you must, it is necessary that you do two things, that you believe that God exists and you believe that he rewards those who diligently seek him. If you spend your life in devotion with God, God God does not want you poor, the devil does. God does not want you sick, the devil does. God does not want you brokenhearted, the devil does. God doesn't want you anything than absolutely perfect, because through Jesus, you are perfect. You know who doesn't want you to understand that, who doesn't want you to get a revelation of that, and doesn't want you to walk in that? The enemy, whose job is to steal and kill and destroy, and Jesus said what? That I came that they might have life, and have it more abundantly. If you're trying to walk with God in any way that isn't faith, it ain't going to work. I'm not trying to tear you down. I know there's a lot of new age thinking that says, well, if I do this, if I check these boxes, if I do all this other, no. God is telling you what it takes. It takes faith. And do you want to know why it takes faith? Because it's a simple thing. Faith, like when you were a kid and dad said, come on, we're going to go get ice cream. You believed that you were getting ice cream when you got in that car. Faith that when mom said, hey, dinner's done, come and eat. The food was there. They weren't tricking you to take you to the doctor's office the way we do with our pets when we tell them we're going to go to the park and then we take them to the vet first. They weren't doing that. God doesn't do that to us. God doesn't go, I've got a blessing for you after you crawl through this terrible, terrible thorny patch that's muddy and grimy and nasty. No. If anything, God makes you a bridge so you can walk over that mess and that muck and that mire and go straight into the good stuff. That's what Jesus did, is he made that bridge. But without faith, it is impossible to please God. It's impossible to walk with God. And we'll see through the rest of this chapter that that faith 
is what all of these Old Testament saints and all of the ones we, can't, we don't have time to mention and aren't written about, that is what they shared. By faith, Noah, or I'm, by, I'm sorry, by faith with confidence in God and his word, Noah, being warned by God about events not yet seen, in reverence, prepared an ark for the salvation of his family. By the way, in case you didn't know, it had never rained before the flood. So the idea of a boat didn't make sense because why would water fall from the sky? Doesn't, we don't know what a flood is. So why would you need this big wooden thing? It's not a house. Why did you put all the stalls in it for the animals? Naturally, it makes no doggone sense. However, by this act of obedience, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which comes by faith. How is it that he condemned the world? Because he was righteous in God's eyes. He had faith that God would do what he said he would do, and he was obedient to doing what God told him to do, and the world did not. Remember that Noah and the ark are a picture of Jesus and salvation from a long, long time ago. In this terrible world of sin that existed, God tells one man, this is how you save him. And his obedience provided that salvation. That's what Jesus did for us. You could argue that a lot of the names we're going to mention are pictures of Jesus in some way, shape, or form. By faith, Abraham, when he was called by God, obeyed by going to a place which he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he lived as a foreigner in the promised land, as in a strange land, living in tents as nomads with Isaac and Jacob, who were fellow heirs of the same promise. For he was waiting expectantly and confidently, looking forward to the city which has foundations, an eternal heavenly city, whose architect and builder is God. He wasn't looking forward to the promised land as in the earthly Jerusalem. He was Abraham. Father Abraham was looking forward to the heavenly city that will come in time. And that's what we see through all these people. They were looking forward to the promise that God had for them. The promise that was revealed to us in Jesus. And I'm getting ahead of myself, and we'll say this in probably about 15 or 20 verses. But that's what it was. By faith... Even Sarah herself received the ability to conceive a child even when she was long past the normal age for it because she considered him who had given her the promise to be reliable and true to his word. Was it that her body was capable? No, it's that God is. So from one man, though he was physically as good as dead because he was 99 at the time, I don't know if you've seen a 99-year-old, I don't know if a 99-year-old looked the same In our time, as they did in Abraham's time, but I'm going to tell you, as good as dead does not speak of a picture of health and vitality. It just doesn't. So from one man, though he physically was as good as dead, were born many, as many descendants as the stars of heaven in number, and and innumerable as the sand on the seashore. Did you know there is more sand There are more grains of sand on the earth than there are stars in the sky. That's a really cool fact. I happened to pick it up today and it seemed pertinent. So there you go. He told, God told Abraham, I will make your descendants as the stars of the heaven and the sand on the shore. I can't count that high. I have no intention of trying. I'll let a computer do that. (laughs) all these died in faith guided and satisfied by it but without receiving the tangible fulfillment of God's promises only having seen or anticipated them and having welcomed them from a distance and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth so are we Now those who say such things make it clear that they are looking for a country of their own. 
And if they had been thinking of that country from which they departed as their true home, they would have had a continuing opportunity to return. But the truth is that they were longing for a better country. That is a heavenly one. For that reason, God is not ashamed of them or to be called their God, even to be surnamed their God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, for he has prepared a city for them. What did they do? They just kept looking forward and they were obedient to what God told them to do. They weren't perfect. Perfection is only found in Jesus. These were flawed individuals. Jacob was a trickster. Abraham constantly, in order, out of fear for pe- thinking that people were going to kill him to marry his wife, he told people Sarah was his sister, which was a half truth because they were half siblings. This is a very, very long time ago. Yes, it's super icky to us now, but it was acceptable at the time, so just roll with it. All of these people, Noah, Enoch, Abel, were looking forward to the fulfillment of the promise. You see, Abel even had a promise. Back in Genesis 3, when Satan was cursed, God said, and, I, and her son, there's a capital S that tells us it's talking about Jesus, you will bruise his heel, but he shall crush your head. Abel was looking forward to the one who would crush the head of the enemy. Noah was looking forward to the salvation that Jesus would provide. Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Sarah, they were looking forward to a heavenly city because they were strangers in a strange land. They didn't know where they were. It wasn't where they came from, and they knew that they weren't going back. They were looking ahead. And because of that, because of that faith and that obedience, God is perfectly happy to be called their God and to be associated with them as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And he's not ashamed of them. And I am so grateful that because of Jesus, God is not ashamed of us. Because I sure don't walk in perfect faith. There are times I need encouragement. Most of the time I try to be the encouragement, but there are times I need encouragement. As much as I might try to be a thermostat, sometimes I wind up being a thermometer, reacting to the temperature instead of setting it. But by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, that is, as the testing of his faith was still in progress, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises of God was ready to sacrifice his only son of promise, to whom it was said, through Isaac, your descendants shall be called. For he considered it reasonable to believe that God was able to raise Isaac even from among the dead. Indeed, in the sense that he was prepared to sacrifice Isaac in obedience to God, Abraham did receive him back from the dead, figuratively speaking. Abraham's body basically had to be resurrected from the dead. We were just told his body physically was as good as dead. We were told that Sarah's womb had to be renewed. They were, 90, they were 89 and 99 years old. God had a lot of work to do to get them back to childbearing. But God did it. Huh? Well, it's just like that for God, but for you and I, if you see, if you see an 89-year-old woman, you are not thinking she's going to be pregnant and have a kid in a year. It takes God. But he had to f- renew and restore their bodies. It was no great leap of faith for Abraham whose son existed as a result of God's healing power, went, okay, well, if Isaac dies, God made a promise. God can bring him back just as easily as he brought me back. God can make him alive again. God's the whole reason he's here anyway. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau, believing what God revealed to him, even regarding things to come. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and bowed in worship, leaning on the top of his staff because he had been injured when he wrestled with God and his hip was wrenched out of socket. No, that's Joseph, not Jacob. I misspoke. Forgive me. Huh? It's Jacob? Oh, right. 
I swear I'm awake, folks. I apologize. But that was what happened with Jacob. He wrestled with God. The caffeine's worn off. That's my problem. Jacob had wrestled with God. His hip got wrenched out of socket, and apparently it never got all the way better because he was worshiping, but he was leaning on the top of his staff to help support him. By faith, Joseph, when he was dying, referred to the promise of God for the exodus of the sons of Israel from Egypt and gave instructions concerning the burial of his bones in the land of the promise. By faith, Moses, after his birth, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful and divinely favored child, and they were not afraid of the king Pharaoh's decree. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter because he preferred to endure the hardship of the people of God rather, to in, rather than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of the Christ, that is, the rebuke that he would suffer for his faithful obedience to God, to be greater wealth than all the treasures of Egypt. For he looked ahead to the reward promised by God, because Abraham had been given a promise about the Israelites and the 400 years of captivity that they would have in Egypt. They were there for 430 years. They spent 400 of those years as a slave. And Moses, his parents had faith that kept him alive. At 40 years old, he decided that he was going to have faith and he was going to stick with his ancestry, not with who nurtured him. And he had all the learning of Egypt but he decided to live his life as a Hebrew instead. By faith, he left Egypt, being unafraid of the wrath of the king. He also left after he had murked a guy, in case you didn't know. That's, that is the reason we are given for him fleeing into the land of Midian. He killed a guy, and then people found out, and he went, oh, crap. Because that would be the response. If you kill somebody, you think you're doing the right thing, and the people you think you're helping aren't happy about it. So they're not covering for you. Anyway, by faith he left Egypt, being unafraid of the wrath of the king, for he endured steadfastly as seeing him who is unseen. By faith he kept the Passover and sprinkling of the blood on the doorstep, doorposts, so the destroyer of the firstborn, firstborn, good gracious, would not touch them, the firstborn of Israel. Now we've jumped 40 years between when... So there, Moses' life tended to happen in 40-year chunks. He was born for 40 years. He was raised in Egypt in Pharaoh's household. He rejected being an Egyptian, decided he was going to be a Hebrew, fled to Midian. He was there for 40 years. He married the priests of God's daughter. He was a shepherd. God met him at the burning bush when he was 80, told him, I am going to use you to lead my people out of Egypt because I have heard their cry and the time is now. To which Moses, in great confidence, went, are you sure? <laughs> he didn't say, all right, let's go get him. He went, I don't think so. You know, I don't talk real good. Aaron, Aaron's the guy. You want Aaron. And God went, no, dude. No, you, you're the guy. I'm, I'm modernizing the language a little bit, but that's kind of the conversation. And so at 80, Moses led the people of Israel for, out of, from the exodus of Egypt. And now by faith, in verse 29, the people of Israel crossed the Red Sea as though they were passing through dry land. Because, and it was a faith thing, because up until that point, after the exodus, what had happened when you read in Exodus 14 and 15, or 13 and 14 is that they had left, they had ransacked the nation of Egypt and taken all their plunder. And they were led by the angel of the Lord, Christ, before he was made flesh, as a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And he was leading them in the path that they were to take. But when they got to the Red Sea and it was time for them to cross, the Bible tells us that he moved to the back of the people of Israel. And he provided light for them so they could cross as but though by daylight while he was simultaneously providing darkness and confusion to the Egyptians. And we're told he did it so well that the Egyptians on one side never even crossed the path of the Israelites on the other side at the same time. So it was an act of faith for the Israelites who had been led to be told, okay, he needs to be here. We need to go. 
It was faith for that nighttime walk. But when the Egyptians attempted it, they were drowned because God wasn't saving them out of the Egyptians. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after it, they had been encircled for seven days by Joshua and the sons of Israel. And by the way, if you look at the battle plan that Joshua and the sons of Israel were given, it could only be a godly battle plan. Nowhere else would you get told, for six days, I want you to go, don't say a word, walk around a city, and then go home. And on the seventh day, you're going to go, walk around the city seven times, and at the end of the seventh time, just shout really loud and play your trumpets and bring the brass band and have them play as loud as they possibly can. And according to history, what happened? The walls fell out. So they just walked in. It takes faith to follow that battle plan. By faith, Rahab, the prostitute, was not destroyed along with those who were disobedient because she had welcomed the spies sent by the sons of Israel in peace. She had sheltered them while they were gathering information and made sure that they stayed safe. Because of that, she was kept safe after the city fell. And if you look, she's included in the genealogy of Jesus. She was acting in faith for a people and a promise that she up to that point had had no part of. And what more shall I say? For time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Japheth, David, and Samuel, and the prophets, who by faith, that is, with an enduring trust in God and his promises, subdued kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promised blessings, closed the mouths of lions, extinguished the power of raging fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became mighty and unbeatable in battle, putting enemy forces to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection, and others were tortured to death, refusing to accept release offered on the condition of denying their faith so they would be resurrected to a better life. And others experienced the trial of mocking and scourging amid torture and even chains and imprisonment. These mighty people of faith who moved mountains, who shook kingdoms, who God used in such a mighty way that if you look since the Exodus, the nation of Egypt has never been anything but a shadow of what it was before. They were a world, they were the world superpower at the time. And now they've got pyramids and some tourism. Because God used them to give himself glory. Because God wanted to make sure that everyone knows that there's only one God and it ain't anybody else. By faith, all of these people that we mentioned came to receive the reward that they were looking forward to. But it didn't mean that they had a clean end here on this earth. Jacob died when he was 120. Joseph died when he was about 145, if my memory serves. Abraham died at 175. I don't remember when Isaac passed away. Noah lived to be 700, 700-ish. Seven to nine hundred, somewhere in there. This is very, very Old Testament, so people lived for bloody ever. <laughs> All of these people, Joshua, Joshua didn't get to see the nation of Israel at peace because he fought the battles that bought peace for them. Moses didn't get to enter into the promised land, but he got to see the people of Israel go into it. Gideon was a coward by all appearances when God appeared to him at the threshing floor. No, he wasn't at the threshing floor. He was in a wine press trying to sift grain. It's the wrong place to do that job. And when God talked to him, he asked for three different signs and tried to talk God out of using him. But he became Israel's judge for 40 years after they were delivered out of the hand of the Midianites because God used Gideon and an army of 300 to defeat the Midianite army of 130,000. Samson brought down the Philistine hall 
and killed more people in his final act than he did in his entire life up to then. And if you read Judges, that's a very impressive statement. I don't know if you've spent time in Judges. It's a bit of a soap opera. It's good reading. It would be a rated R movie if it got adapted. But it's good to know that history. And all these other people, Samuel didn't get to see the king that was supposed to come. King David didn't get to build the temple for God that he wanted. King Solomon saw his kids squander, or was told that his kids were going to squander the kingdom of Israel and Judah because he hadn't stayed true to God and he had married foreign wives and started following their beliefs and offering sacrifices to their idols. All of these people in the Old Testament were flawed. And for so many of them, it did not end well. We believe that the prophet Isaiah was sawn in two. We know that so many prophets were not treated well. So many prophets were killed by the people that they came to serve. And we don't like to confront that. We don't like the fact that living for God means that the world hates you. But Jesus said as much in John. Jesus said the world will hate you. Don't worry about it. It hated me first and it hates me a whole lot more. I would love to be able to tell you that once you accept Christ, it's all beer and stittles. It's not. But it is so, so worth it. Not because things get easier here. In fact, things tend to get harder for people once they accept Christ and start to walk following his path. If for no other reason than the fact that you have an enemy and his job is to work against you. It's not a personal thing. He just hates you because you're a Christian. I'd love to be able to tell you something else, but I'd be lying to you, and I try really hard not to lie when I'm here. I try not to lie in general. It's better for my long-term health, you know. Verse 37, they were stoned to death, they were sawn in two, they were lured with tempting offers to renounce their faith. They were put to death by the sword. They went, wrapped, they went about wrapped in the skins of sheep and goats, utterly destitute, oppressed, cruelly treated, people of whom the world was not worthy. Wandering in deserts and mountains and living in caves and holes in the ground. All of these people, all of these prophets, all of these Old Testament saints who chose to live for God and were obedient to what God had for them. The Bible says that this world wasn't worthy of them because this world is fallen. And they were doing everything in their power to live for God. You know, we as Christians are the ones who are keeping this world going. The Bible says that after the rapture happens, things are going to get very bad very quickly because God has favored us and we're not going to be here. That's when the rules change. It's at the rapture, but that's a different bunny trail to fall down. But all of these, though they gained divine approval through their faith, did not receive the promise, did not receive the fulfillment of what was promised because God had us in mind and had something better for us. So that, these, so that they, these men and women of authentic faith, would not be made perfect, that is, completed in him, apart from us. When we think about the heroes of the faith through the Old Testament, Father Abraham, Moses, King David, King Solomon, any of the prophets that you would care to name and you would care to mention, God received them when they, passed, when they died, when their souls left their earthly bodies, God received them into the bosom of Abraham, which was not in heaven yet. But because God had us 
in mind, not just the Jewish people, but the world in mind. He delayed the fulfillment of the promise until just the right time so that salvation could be offered for everyone, so that salvation could be bought and purchased for everyone. That's why, and I'm just going to read this first verse. Actually, the first two. They're very long verses, but the first two verses of chapter 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, all of these Old Testament saints, who by faith have testified to the truth of God's absolute faithfulness, stripping off every unnecessary weight and the sin which so easily and cleverly entangles us, let us run with endurance and active persistence the race that is set before us, looking away from all that will distract us and focusing our eyes on Jesus, who is the author and the center of our faith, or perfecter of our faith, the first incentive for our belief and the one who brings our faith to maturity, who, for the joy of accomplishing the goal set before him, endured the cross, disregarding the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, revealing his deity, his authority, and the completion of his work. We hold on in faith because look at what God has done for us. I hold on in faith, not because everything goes my way, but because God is still good. I do everything in my power to be obedient to what God has told me to do because God is still good. I base my life on this word to the best of my ability because he who made these promises is faithful and true to his word. And he will not leave me disappointed. He will not leave me ever. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. The Bible tells us that when we accept Jesus, a whole host of things are done. You're given the fullness of Holy Spirit. Your inner man, your soul, is renewed, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed. You are sanctified, which means you are set aside as holy by God for God's purposes. You are justified, which means that the legal ramifications for sin, those charges are dropped because Jesus paid the penalty for you. We are given the fullness of Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And he is our guarantee that God will fulfill his promise and that after your soul leaves the body, it is assigned to it will be received by God in heaven, where you will spend forever with him in the new Jerusalem. But grace is only here for the current time. Grace and the easy requirements of accepting Jesus are only for this church age. You might have heard Pastor Bob say it, but it remains true. The last days started when Jesus ascended. We've been in the last days ever since then. And someone asked one time, why does every generation believe that the rapture is going to happen in their lifetime? And the best answer I've heard is because if they didn't, they wouldn't do anything. They wouldn't get any work done. But the rapture is closer than it's ever been. For all I know, it could happen now. Nope, not now. God has made accepting Jesus so simple, it's almost stupid. It's a two-step process. If you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead on the third day, and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. Them's the rules. That's all there is to it. It's a simple thing. And the reason God made it so simple is because it takes faith. It doesn't take a checklist. It doesn't take staying within the lines. It takes trusting God. So if you haven't, I'm very confident for the people who are here, 
but I don't know about the people who watch online or the people who catch this later on YouTube. If you haven't accepted Jesus as your Savior, I would love to introduce you to my friend. It'll be the best decision you ever make. It'll be the simplest decision you ever make. And it's one with eternal reward. If you'd be kind enough to bow your head, close your eyes. We're going to say a prayer and speak a blessing. Repeat after me, Father, I know that I'm a sinner. And without you, I don't stand a chance of heaven. So right now, as a matter of my will, I accept Jesus as my Lord and my Savior. Come live in me today. In Jesus' name, amen. And if that's the first time you've ever prayed that prayer, I want you to know you started a party in heaven. The Bible says angel rejo angels rejoice when one soul is brought into the kingdom. You started a party. It's a good thing. And now, I'm going to say a prayer and speak a blessing. We'll be on our merry way after this. And if there's something that you would like prayer for or you'd like to talk with me about after the service, I would absolutely love to get to do that. Let's try this one more time. Bow your heads, close your eyes. Father, thank you for who you are and how you love us. Lord, we bless you and we give you all the praise and the honor and the glory because you're the only one to whom those things are due. Father, we thank you that you sent Jesus to die on the cross so that we could have a home with you in heaven after we leave this earth and a victorious life while we're still here, even though it may not be an easy one. Father, I thank you for the word that has gone forth tonight. I thank you that it hasn't been hot air blown around by some lump of clay, but that it's been good seed received into good soil, that it takes root and bears fruit in our lives, and that as we go from here, we are going to look more like Jesus in everything we say, everything we do, the way that we do it, and with the thoughts that we think. I thank you, Father, that you have made us the salt and the light that this bland and darkened world so desperately needs, and I praise you, Father, that through Holy Spirit, you have given us the boldness to preach the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you for the gift of your Son. Father, I pray that we would feel your love, that we would get a revelation of your word and your character that draws us into closer, more intimate relationship with you, that we would live our lives in dependence on you, not on money, not on ourselves, not on our family or our friends or our spouses, but on you. Father, you never fail. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever, even unto the end of the ages. And we thank you and praise you for that. Lord, we pray for the families of those officers who were shot today. Lord, for the family of the officer who lost his life and the officer who was injured. Lord, for their family and their friends, we pray comfort. We pray your peace. We pray your hope, your joy, your patience, and your understanding as they go through this time. Lord, help them to understand that this was a work of the enemy. You did not cause this. Father, you can use all things for good, but you did not cause all things. We thank you, Father, that though we know not how, this situation will go to giving you glory, that people will be brought closer to you, that souls will be brought into the kingdom. Father, we thank you for workers for the kingdom, or workers for the harvest. You've said the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So pray that the Father would send workers for the harvest. We do that. And Lord, we bless the nation of Israel. They are still your chosen people. And Lord, we support them and praise you for them. And we thank you that the situation they're going through right now will, in time, go to giving you glory. We pray all these things in Jesus' mighty, holy name. Amen. May grace and peace be multiplied unto you, and I speak a blessing on everyone here in the six major areas of life, business, home, social, physical, mental, and spiritual. Father, pour out your love, your power, your grace, your spirit in such a mighty way that when the rest of the world sees them, they will say, surely these people have been with Jesus. If you receive that, say amen. amen. That is wonderful to hear. I love you all more than chocolate. There's nothing you can do to stop me. Have a fantastic rest of your week. We will see you next time. God bless you.